It is my pleasure to uh, welcome Kai Fu Li, President of Greater China, to give us an open talk about China, about Google China. And uh, please welcome uh, Kai Fu Li. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much, Feng. Um, I know after the talk there may be a lot of questions still. Uh, Feng is uh, one of the early employees at, at Google, right? Number a few hundred. <laughs> and uh, he's also working very closely with the China team. So if you have any questions about the talk and, some, and we don't get to talk, feel free to connect with him as well. Uh, it's really great to see so many um, uh, familiar faces, old friends, uh, back in Seattle again. Um, today I'm going to tell you about what I've been up to for the, um, for the last um, year and a half. Actually, I, know, I think you know what I've been up to the first two months of the year and a half. <laughs> but the remaining, the remaining 16 months, a lot of exciting things have happened. So I'm going to just tell you about, about it. Um, I'm going to tell you about the opportunity um, for, for, uh, for, for any internet company in China and then tell you a little bit about, at a very high level, what we're trying to accomplish in China, um, how we're hiring great people, targeting great plans, and then tell you a bit about how we're working with um, worldwide R&D to really build great products uh, for China and for worldwide, and that we have a special relationship with our sister office in Kirkland, and we want to do a lot of projects together. So first, opportunities and challenges. Well, China is huge. Everybody knows that. Um, I think everyone here knows that the internet population is rapidly catching up with the U.S. Um, at about 140 million um, at, at, as of today. And um, it's, it's getting close to the American um, internet population. But more excitingly, it's growing at 25% rather than 3%. So at this rate, uh, in a few years, China will be the largest internet country in the whole world. Uh, even more excitingly, broadband. Uh, in the last year, Chinese broadband users overtook uh, American broadband users. Many people might assume China as a poorer country would have less broadband coverage, but that's wrong. Uh, broadband is huge in China because the metropolitan distribution uh, matches very well uh, buildup of great broadband networks inside metropolitan areas. Uh, mobile phones, it's even no comparison. There are 440 million uh, paid subscribers in China. And you, as you can see here, the, um, there are many more mobile users than internet users. So uh, many people may be experiencing internet the first time on their phone, not on their PC. And the last one, even a bigger disproportionate comparison, is that engineering graduates in China outnumber the US 8 to 1. So these are all reasons we want to be in China, right? We want to reach the internet uh, population, uh, take advantage of broadband, and demonstrate our great products, such as um, uh, Google Video and others that do require uh, broadband, uh, reach the mobile users, and of course, hire the engineering graduates. But at the same time, China's full of challenges. Um, some of the challenges are that the internet is um, uh, a combination is much younger audience in China compared to the United States. Um, there are many more younger users, and the users are much more interested in fun and somewhat less interested in pursuit of knowledge. So if you go to an internet cafe, who's been to, who's been to an internet cafe in China? Very, very few. Um, you, you might notice that the browser is not even installed <laughs> or used in many, on many machines. Right? People are there to do what? games, music, video, movies, and occasionally a browser window pops up, usually a pop-up ad of some sort. Um, so browsing is not common and certainly so, so much farther out for search. Uh, there is a very grassroots usage. Um, a lot of the uh, grassroots users love entertainment, MP3, and games. Um, and, and also there is a strong sense of community. So if you go to one of the portals in China, look at one of the popular controversial news, and you'll see 10,000 responses with people arguing with each other. The sense of community is very strong. Um, BBS, you know, a concept that nobody uses in the US anymore, bulletin boards. You know, I remember that from my college days. But, uh, um, but in China, how many page views a day? One billion. So that's how alive and well the BBS is and the sense of community that it brings. Um, there's a, unfortunately, uh, there's a lack of credit card or credit card credit system. You know, eBay tried to establish that. It didn't really quite fly. It seems like people 
are not completely ready to build up trust over the internet. People are willing to meet each other, talk to each other, play games with each other, learn new concepts over the internet, but when they want to hand over money, they want to see the merchandise and the person that, that's selling to you. Okay, So that, that's different. And of course, not having credit cards causes a bunch of issues. Um, advertisers aren't able to track returns as well. E-commerce is slower to take off. So that's a bit on the downside. Um, and then the high growth market will have very rapid changes. New users coming on board. Leaders la last year might not be leaders anymore. Um, so that's uh, quite, a, quite a dynamic market. Um, and of course, government regulatory policies are different. US is about as open as you get. Now, many countries do have restrictions on the internet, and China is among them. Um, aggress fast-moving competitors. Um, those of you who've seen uh, Chinese internet companies realize that companies move fast, um, and then they um, are also very aggressive in, 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 in trying to get market share or um, uh, perhaps are ridiculing their competitors and things like that. It's um, rather like a wild, wild west um, in terms of internet competition. There's a perception that non-local internet companies fall. Um, every talk I ever give, this question always comes up, you know, co company X, Y, Z have all failed in China. Why do you think you'll succeed? Uh, some might even include us as companies that have failed, and we haven't even started. <laughs> so um, that um, mystery and um, uh, legend uh, needs to be disproved, and Google is certainly out and committed to disprove that multinational internet companies can, in fact, succeed in China. So that's the landscape. And I want to tell you a little bit our, about our plan. Um, as you might expect, um, you're not going to hear anything about our products or strategy overall. But I'll give you an idea of what we hope to accomplish in the coming years and how we're going about building a team. So back to this um, 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 belief or mystery that internet multi multinational companies shall fail in China. So why should Google be different? I think our primary, my primary answer for that is something Eric Schmidt said to me last week. We will take a long-term view to win in China. Chinese have a 5,000 years of history. Google has 5,000 years of patience. Okay? <laughs> we, we sure hope it happens a lot sooner than that, but we're making a long-term bet. You know, we're not in China to make a profit today. We're not in China to grab market share at all costs. We are committed to China and the Chinese users and winning them over by building better products. And before you build better products, you've got to have a good team. So market shares will fluctuate, but we're deeply committed to building the right thing in the long term. So with that in mind, our plan is really, in the past year that, that I have been in China, we were there to build foundation. It's a year of building. It's a year of planting. And hopefully this year, this year will become a year of harvesting. So in 06, we've established presence. We've um, built a website that complies with local laws. We come up with a Chinese name. Um, some people might ask about our Chinese name, whether they like it or not. Some people love it. Some people don't love it. Um, but the important thing to realize is half of the internet users do not know how to spell Google. So we want a Chinese name so that they can type G-U-G-E dot C-N and get to our website. Uh, we've started uh, marketing to universities, because that's where the next gen users will come out of and where there's a natural inclination to liking Google. We've established some partnerships. You might have heard about the China Mobile Partnership, as well as the Xunlei investment that we've made. And we have many more that will be coming down the pike. Uh, of course, you know those deals took, take months to negotiate and discuss. And 06 was when we did it. And lastly, in bold, is the biggest thing we did. We really built a great foundation by building a world-class engineering team. And I'll say more about that later. So if 06 was a year of uh, planting, then 07 shall be a year of harvesting. And that this is the year when you will undisputably see that Google Chinese search is the best search that exists in quality, in speed, in um, completeness, in coverage, in freshness, in features, in every possible imaginable way. Now, if you don't quite see that today, um, go home and try google.cn again. See if it's already improved over a few months ago. Um, but if you still are not satisfied, you can fully expect that um, the best is yet to come. 
And it's not just web search. As you know, Google has a large portfolio of products, and we're building many products, localizing many products, modifying a lot of products, combining a lot of products, and they will all be coming out in 07. And that will be a um, pleasant surprise to the many fans that we have in China. Now, some of you work in companies that build five-year plans. So this is as far as we've got. Yeah, 06 last year and 07 this year. As you know, Google is in the internet industry. We don't build very long-term plans. But if you insist on seeing one more bullet, I will um, satisfy that request. You know, sometime before 7006, <laughs> we shall become the most popular, successful, useful service in China. Hopefully a lot before. <clears throat> and that's the 5,000-year comment that Eric made. You know? <laughs> so now the second point I want to talk about is building a great team. So the long-term approach we're taking is really not going to China and let's squeeze revenue, get advertising, build channels, and of course we have to do all that, but those aren't the top priority. The top priority is you got to have a team that's local, that understands Chinese users, that builds a product that they, their parents, their friends all want to use. And that starts with a team. If you don't have a team, you've got a bunch of Americans, and Chinese Americans if you want, they're not going to build the right products because they're not in market. Uh, they're not talking to their friends about what's new and exciting and, and important to them. Okay? So building a great local team is, in fact, our worldwide strategy. And it's particularly important in China, where the market dynamics, as we talked earlier, are quite different. So how did we build a great team? So I'm going to tell you our six form formula of six points of how we managed to build uh, great R&D. Of course, first, you've got to have, hire great people. Um, so great people are all over the place. So we've announced um, Beijing in 05, Taipei in 06, Shanghai in 07, and possibly more in the future. Um, we want to go where the talents are. Right? We, we go to a lot of, we went the first year and made a lot of hires, and some of them, we heard a bunch of people didn't apply to us. And we said, well, why not? They said, well, I want to live in the South. I hate Beijing. So we opened up Shanghai. So <laughs> um, that's why we have Kirkland. That's why we have New York, Atlanta. Um, London, and so on and so forth. Um, but that's the approach we're taking. We go where the people are. We've also hired a bunch of senior people. Um, we've hired, um, uh, we've brought a lot of Chinese Googlers from um, Mountain View, um, Kirkland, and New York to move to China to seed the culture, because that's really important. right? Um, and uh, we want to double all of these in, in 07, and probably double again in 08. And in 06, we hired um, about 100 people. Okay, that's um, may not sound like a huge number, but um, if you have friends or who have interviewed at Google, you know it's a pretty high bar. And finding 100 was really, really tough task. Uh, we have become instantly the number one employer. If you don't believe it, go on Shui uh, Mu Qinghua BBS and check out where the graduates want to go. Um, we're not involved in that website, and it's basically um, everybody really, um, not everybody, but you know, 70, 80, 90 percent of the top people would choose Google as the number one destination if they're computer science graduates. Um, so over months, that's become possible. Nearly 100% in our first year accepted our offer. About 90% accepted our offer this year. Uh, we've hired a champion, programming champion of the world, ACM. We've also hired the champion of CodeJam, which is uh, Google's own programming competition. Hired number one student from many universities, and will grow and double, and on, so on and so forth. So this is going really, really well. Now, the great people are coming on board, you know, senior people typically from abroad, uh, Chinese Americans or Chinese um, um, people with Chinese ancestry um, coming to, back to China, and then local campus hires uh, locally, and they're working well together, but that's only the first step. The other thing is, we got lots of people who, who love us in China, so we're, um, if you want to know why do people want to work at Google, googlehireme.com is an interesting website by a, uh, by a student who wanted to be hired by us. Um, there's um, a bunch of people who love us. We call them frogs, friends of Google. Um, they add, there's actually a website called gfan.org. Sorry, I forgot to put that up, which is a bunch of Chinese people, who, Chinese users, bloggers who love us. And then we've come up with our own China blog, googlechinablog.com, to tell people what we are. So it's, it's more a little bit of soft marketing to tell people, hey, this is a great place to work, so tell your friends about it. So that's another thing we did. And of course, another strength is I have, we have, is that um, Google is pretty popular on campuses. And um, I was told I'm pretty popular on Chinese campuses too. So this is a picture of one talk I gave. <laughs> 
um, slightly larger than this crowd, huh? Um, this is another talk I gave. Um, and at this talk, the um, president of the university said, hey, Kai Fu, there's another 3,000 people waiting outside. And I said, that can't be. And then he, sh oh, I don't have the picture, sorry. There's a picture somewhere that shows the 3,000 people outside. <laughs> so um, I guess everything in China is large scale, but I think Google's popularity also helps. Um, there are also a number of opportunities that to get the word out outside of the talks we gave. Here is an example. I wrote a book upon joining Google, and it's sold 700,000 copies. And um, we've hosted a, a Google Code Jam, which, um, in which 13,000 people entered and competed. And up there is me giving the award to the champion, who shortly after that joined Google. Um, but it's important also that we um, tell people, this is Google you're joining. You're not joining an outsourcing company. You're not joining a localization company. You're joining a company that has special values, um, that we, we, we believe in equal equality, that we believe in um, changing the world, that we believe in um, providing access to information, organizing the world's information, that we believe in that, that it's really very engineering-centric organization. And we really want to make sure people understand this is a special, unique, different company. So we have special orientations set up. I gave you know, so many talks, I can't count to our new hires. We have old timers who come and visit. Actually, Feng was one of them. And, but, but whenever they come, we have round tables. And of course, we have to lead by example. And remember that we represent Google culture, not cu culture of other companies we may have worked for. Um, and we have to localize the jobs. Okay, we can't just say, hey, one size fit all, everywhere is equal. Well, you know, in China, they employ, the, high, the people we hire aren't going to be as good English speakers. So as long as they're willing to learn English, we're happy to take on um, the, anyone who's a good researcher and engineer. Uh, we also create mentorship so that people get help. And we have lots of training, uh, including six to 12 months worth training, training in Mountain View, which is rather exceptional because we're betting everything in long term. These employees, we're betting long term. We're willing to train them, even if they're not going to be instantaneously squeezing them every line of code out of them. That is not our goal, is to prepare them for the long haul. Um, and of course, make it fun. This is what you know Google to be for. You're among, um, in an office, that's a lot of fun, but uh, we think the China office is even more fun. We do a lot of office uh, team building activities. So here you see some of the fun things we've done. We've done office decoration. On the left side, you see uh, some people brought a tent. Uh, another group brought a bed, and uh, I remember seeing the the, the mover who, who brought the bed in from the furniture store, just shaking his head and said, I can't believe this company letting employees bring beds into the office. Um, we have other, and we also just moved into our new big building. This we moved in last September. This is our building in, in Beijing, uh, in Zhongguancun, near Tsinghua University. Uh, we're there for an obvious reason. <laughs> um, this is recruiting, of course. This is our lobby. And this shows you some of the historic uh, pictures um, of the people. On the lower right-hand side, you'll see a bunch of people crawling on the, on the floor and getting picture taken. That is to symbolize, um, you know, some people like to call Google, go, go, you know, dog, dog. So they're trying to be um, cute dogs there. And here is a picture of people writing lots of fun things on our billboard. You can see people really have a very outgoing, um, fun mentality. You know, somebody decided to put a sponsored AdWords on the bottom of that page, for example. Um, here is um, at our opening ceremony of our you know, building. And then um, you see pictures of lots of people um, really working in a uh, place that's highly, very colorfully decorated. And, there, and here is the, a very Chinese decoration um, in one of the offices. And more people coding away, our famous um, um, surround you with monitors. <laughs> and um, this is our uh, karaoke room. Uh, that's to show you we do localize. You, know, you don't see one of those in Kirkland. <laughs> uh, if you come to our massage room, guess what? It's not just back massage, it's also foot massage, of course. <laughs> uh, some things are universal. So you got our exercise room and foosball and um, Lower is the pool table, and then left side, another Chinese tradition, right? Dance, dance, revolution. And of course, the most famous um, cafeteria. Uh, we were just interviewing in December for our, um, 
for our um, executive chef. And we advertised all over China. We, in fact, uh, looked for a consultant who is kind of the expert of knowing who's the best chef in China. We said, can you recommend a couple of people to come and interview? And what he said was, can I interview? <laughs> and, and, and he's actually one of the finalists. Here's the picture of the other finalist. Uh, we'll be opening our uh, cafeteria in March. Okay, we can't claim to have the most engineers or the most senior engineers, but I'm certain we'll have the best food of all of our offices. <laughs> so that's how we went about building a great team. Now I want to talk just a little bit about market opportunities. I know you're all here curious what we're building in China. So needless to say, I can't tell you what we're building. But I can tell you what we've looked at the market. I mean, you can see a lot of this from analyst studies too. What are the interesting market opportunities? You know, we may or may not tackle all of them. Uh, we talked a little bit about the community concept. Um, but here is a couple of others. Uh, we'll start with the search. So when it comes to just pure web search, that's our core business, our bread and butter, the thing with that matters to the most to us. Here we know that quality matters, that we know that if we could improve our search quality lead over our competitors by some gap, then users will notice, then word of mouth will spread, then market share will change, will improve. And that's what we saw in 2001 when Google pull, pulled ahead of its competitors. Um, and you could argue that that gap hasn't yet been realized um, again in a lot of various markets. But we think we are actually making so much progress in search quality. And if you don't believe it, go home and search for something really difficult in Chinese and see if we do better. Now with search quality, you can't beat someone else all the time. Um, it would be lucky to you know, win two out of three. That would be really, really good. But I think we're going to get there. And when you're two out of three, users will move over. Now, of course, brand also matters. <clears throat> and we fully recognize that in the Google brand advantage in the US isn't necessarily carried over abroad. And we certainly don't claim that we have such an advantage in China. So we have to work harder. Okay? Um, secondly, that we also notice that all search engines, the Chinese quality, are lower than English. Okay. Our Chinese is not as good as our English. Yahoo's Chinese is not as good as their English. To us, that means there's an opportunity. It just means we haven't worked hard at it. Uh, with search quality, you can't come up with an innovation overnight. You just have to labor away day after day, night after night. And that's what we've been doing. And we're rewarded by seeing significant relevance improvements. Um, I believe we um, were ahead last year. I think we're significantly ahead today. And you'll have to judge for yourself if you can see that in our Chinese search. Um, but of course, relevance, which means you know, how good are the top three or five results, uh, that's just one metric. It's a little bit academic. End of the day, people have to look at the whole page and see that, hey, you got this, you got that, you got this feature. And the experience looks good. The UI looks good. The font looks pretty. The highlighting looks nice. All of that is what it's going to take to really win in search experience. And we realize we still have things we need to do. You need only compare us with some of the other engines to see that, hey, there are a few areas Google could do better. So we know that. We're working on it. So um, here is our product roadmap. <laughs> it has X's on all the things that haven't shipped. Uh, but you can see we got lots of them. Okay. Um, and then there's that's core search. There's a lot of adjacent search opportunities. Just like in the US, many of you probably have got used to you know, news search, image search, other searches. Uh, we also think they're important for China. And we're going to need to, once we get, we're now, I think web search is now under control, making progress. We need to look at some of these. This is not a promise that all of these are being worked on or are important. But basically, looking at the market, these seem important to a um, search company. <clears throat> so new search is big because um, it's one of the top three uses. Uh, journalists use it, and they're very influential. Image search is important. Um, somehow Chinese love to look at pictures. Uh, we think they, this can be 10 or 20% of traffic. Uh, book search is quite important. China is the world's largest publisher of books. So making that available uh, through, um, for example, Google has a global book search program which even makes offline books searchable, though not readable and downloadable necessarily, depending on copyright restrictions. And we think that's important, especially if we want to also help move some of the gaming internet masses to the knowledge-seeking internet masses. 
Uh, scholar search is quite important. Actually, China, uh, Google already has launched that, and, and ch Google's um, scholar search, Chinese is the number two language after English. And we're already seeing in Chinese universities, um, maybe not quite as much as in the American universities, uh, professors are uh, arguing not so much about how who has more cited SCI index articles, uh, but arguing who ranks higher on Google Scholar. <laughs> and that's a good sign of success. Um, and um, blog and BBS search is, um, is very important in China because that's um, a lot of uh, news is actually done. A lot of reporters in China nowadays um, don't look for phone calls to get news. They go to BBSs and blogs and try to mine news out of that. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon that, that's quite unique to China. So providing that kind of a search uh, also matches the emerging Web 2.0 content, which is really large. Um, as you know, uh, the most popular um, blog in China, I think, has about, I believe, 60 million um, un, um, uh, page views in the past few months. That's, that's how large it is. It's just one person. <clears throat> um, even my blog has over a million page views, which is pretty good. <laughs> and I hardly put anything in it. <laughs> and uh, uh, knowledge search is an interesting concept. It kind of started in Korea, where there's a, a lack of, of solid web content. So people created questions, and others answered them. And then they got linked together, sort of to create for the um, scarcity of data in the web. And that's taken off in a few places. I think it's pretty big in Korea, taking off in Japan. And possibly that's an Asian phenomenon. It hasn't seemed to have really taken off in the, in the US or uh, Europe. And then lastly, client software is an interesting opportunity and also a challenge. Uh, those of you who have relatives in China would know that PCs are infected with um, malware and spyware, uh, taken over by spyware, uh, redirects your um, Sometimes people tell us, hey, when I type google.com, how come I'm redirected to this other website? Did you guys do it? I said, no, no, no. Some malware did something bad, right? And ads pop up, and, um, and uh, also uh, hijacking the address bar is very, very popular, and uh, messing up your registry settings. And um, I'm hopeful that um, um, Windows Vista may solve some of the problems, but, um, but it, it is a huge problem in China. Um, but it's also a big opportunity because people really are used to downloading shareware and software. Um, perhaps they're a bit too trusting. And I think you know, we can, at the same time, provide a lot of value add useful software for people to download and use. But at the same time, trying to increase awareness that uh, people need to be careful. And there are certain companies and products one could trust, and perhaps others less so. So these are various opportunities that one could address in China. Um, another one is local. <clears throat> um, Chinese internet users, needless to say, are concentrated in the metropolitan areas. And these people are starting to get prosperous and wealthy. They're making more money. They're able to get internet access. They're also able to um, you know, buy their girlfriend flowers on a Valentine's Day or look for a nice restaurant and perhaps um, look for a nicer rental, maybe buy a house, perhaps even buy a car and look for um, driving directions and, and bus routes and, and uh, public transit. And, and all that is happening in the city. See, that pro that, that's an opportunity um, that I think is, is interesting. You know, for those of you who are Chinese, this is about yi shi zhu xing, or chi he wan le, right? something that um, I think people really, really, really um, gravitate towards for uh, the 5,000 years of, of history. And um, um, also, there are a number of opportunities still open. Um, there's no yellow pages. There's no local search leadership. There's no um, classified ads. There's no Craigslist yet. And there's very little legal risks. This is just about you know, buying nice, cheap, useful stuff. This has nothing to do with you know, uh, information or sensitive sensitivities. And, um, and also, this potentially could connect well with mobile. So here I just show a couple of examples of uh, popular websites that I use. You know, Ganji is a good Craigslist-like site. Kushin is a nice classified search. Sofan is a nice real estate search. And Dianping is a nice restaurant search. So it's a little bit hard to use, but one could imagine this set of things will, will want to emerge and be developed further. Uh, one, one potential um, opportunity would be, you can imagine, if you go to Google and let's say you go to our um, web search or even local search, and you type gourmet food, Beijing, Wang Fujing, and you might get some result like that with uh, restaurant ratings and everything. Okay. 
and that's something you can actually try out. This is where it's in an experimental phase. Um, if you want to try it out, it's called d2.google.com. D2 is spelled D-I-T-U, of course. <clears throat> um, there's uh, big mobile opportunities. We talked about this earlier with 440 million people using the mobile phone and uh, with 40% of them on web. I think that's a little bit exaggerated. These are people who paid for web capabilities. Perhaps only a quarter of them actually use web on a regular basis. Um, but with 1 billion SMS a day, um, there's even opportunities without web to really address this wonderful market. So the opportunities I can see are you know, just searching on net, on China Mobile's net, of all the possible downloads and books to listen to and read and ringtones and music and pictures that, um, that China Mobile and its partners provide, that's already very rich, you know, millions of pieces of data. Searching that is, 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 is difficult. Of course, WAP search over, in general, um, searching everything, that's even bigger. And then connections to local I talked about. You can imagine, you know, uh, asking about a Sichuan restaurant nearby or ATM near my house or uh, bus route to go to work. These are things you could imagine sending a short SMS and getting some responses on. Uh, we've partnered with uh, China Mobile in mainland China, Chenghua Telecom in Taiwan, and we're building a worldwide platform, and uh, we're learning a lot from deployment, especially in Japan, where we're really quite advanced working with KDDI, uh, hoping to really bring that to even a larger number of users in China. Uh, video and music are both big, but they're both difficult. Uh, video is big because of the high broadband penetration. The market's growing big. There's not a YouTube yet. There are probably 30 YouTube copycats. Um, um, the licensing rules are unclear. Currently, you have to be a domestic company to get a video license, but that's um, possibly going to change in the next year. Uh, music, on the other hand, is huge already in China. Uh, it's the number one content being searched for, and uh, most of the Chinese users have used it. And yet, the core decisions and precedences are not really quite established. Uh, there's been a couple of lawsuits recently, and uh, the, the, the music labels won some and lost some. The ones they lost um, seems to indicate it's going to be quite difficult for music labels to assert their copyright in China because the laws are rather complex and still evolving. Uh, I'm certainly hopeful that over time, uh, there will be greater respect for IP and copyright, but certainly right now, this looks like a somewhat chaotic market uh, with the music labels not able to make, make a lot of money on their, um, on, the, on their creation. So those are just some possible market opportunities. Uh, I forgot to list community as another one. Communities are big. I talked already about BBS and uh, mentioned it earlier, but that would be another area I think is quite important. So lastly, let me talk a little bit about, OK, so if, um, if, if, if you should feel, hey, Google China's got this act together, I think number one reason is we're taking the long-term view. We're hiring great people. Number two is we're an an analyzing the market, and we're going to build stuff that the market wants. Um, but I think another third one is we want to have strong connections to our headquarters and worldwide R&D. If you look at all the companies that have failed in China, it often comes down to, is the team in China trusted and empowered uh, to do the job it needs to do? Okay. If headquarters does not trust its China team, holds very tight reins, controls it tightly, enforces global platform, doesn't allow it to innovate and build products and control the UI, then those companies have tended to fail. So as I started to build up the team and build a longer term plan in China, I also realized it's important for the China team to establish credibility and also to educate the headquarters why China is unique, important, growing, and critical to the company's future. So here are just some pictures um, that you can see that, uh, that sort of represent the work that we have done. This is Eric Schmidt visiting China, talking to the, Chinese, uh, the American ambassador to China about um, um, how to do business in China and why, why it's important to US and to, to Google. Um, here's a picture of our uh, general counsel, our head of engineering, among other senior people listening to, to, um, to VIPs such as the uh, ambassador speaking about the importance of China. This is um, in a, um, by the way, this is in Guibin Lo, <laughs> a very um, uh, Chinese hotel that we took them to. Um, here's a visit to university. Here is uh, a bunch of our senior people visiting uh, Beijing University, interacting with the students. This is our Jeff Dean, our um, 
uh, Google Fellow, uh, explaining technology to a bunch of um, Beida uh, professors. Uh, this is Gotham, one of our senior engineers um, on the web crawling. Uh, this is Marissa Meyer, our VP of Product Management. Um, and this is um, um, Mike Dixon, head of our Google News. And then, just to make sure, people have engraved in their minds that this is a country with 5,000 years of history. And some of the interesting challenges and the opportunities come from the years of history. We had Googlers reenact some of the past uh, things in Google's history. Uh, this one is showing the glorious days to the extent that the Chinese people feel so proud and in some cases maybe even superior of of, of, of its, its, its history and, and successes. This is Qianlong Huangdi um, um, accepting uh, barbarians' um, tokens of appreciation. Okay? <laughs> and, and if people want to know, you know how did the current um, government uh, form its credibility and, um, and, and, and how it um, uh, disseminates information to the public, this shows the um, the, the basically um, a set of people in the uh, propaganda group in the military trying to uh, disseminate key information. Um, this shows, well, why are there Chinese people so suddenly grasping onto prosperity? This shows sort of a um, rapid attempt to jump and catch up with the 21st century in a rural area of a, what a wedding might look like. Um, to understand how the Chinese government works, this is a mock debate of um, two, um, several um, cabinet members arguing about um, a particular um, issue, showing you how the Chinese government bureaucracy works. And this is people being entertained in the audience. And this is um, um, Alan Eustace, my boss, and a bunch of engineers getting little red books and flipping through them. Uh, this is everybody in the Chinese uniform. This is our Chinese uh, name launch. This is the big Google-style party. This is the Google dance. This is more pictures. This is one of the Googlers getting tricked on stage. <laughs> so lots of fun, but really connecting so that people understand uh, why it is the way it is and how we can learn from the lessons of the past, understanding the Chinese culture, people, um, expectations, feelings, so that we have a chance to be successful. Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about R&D, a little bit about how we do R&D, how we do it worldwide, how we develop products, and, how, and lastly, how we connect with Kirkland. So very interesting fact is that we have 30 R&D offices worldwide, uh, all built in three years. This is probably an uh, unbelievable feat by any um, imaginable uh, um, um, any possible imagination. You can see it all over the world, uh, in Europe, Russia, Eastern Europe, Israel, United States, Canada, Australia, Brazil, India, Japan, um, and of course China. So how do we do all this? Well, these are a couple of things that we try to do. Uh, one is we have a, well, how do you avoid redundancy with so many R&D centers? Well, we actually, have, we actually manage everything um, by the internet. Right, by the intranet in this case. We keep all of our projects, milestones, progress is all included in what's called PDB, our product database. And that um, this, this will ensure that we, before you do something, well, you better search for this, this thing you're building to make sure if someone else isn't building it, maybe you can use theirs or they can use yours or you can do it together. And of course, sometimes, you know, a little bit of redundancy, if it's alternate approaches, could make sense. You know, let the internet prove which is the best approach. Um, second is that we want to be reasonable about work distribution. You know, we're not going to force each group to, us, to assign, you know, China shall work on X, Kirkland will work on Y. We're also not going to let them randomly pick. So really, we, we, we try to get each R&D center to have, to drive certain larger initiatives. And you'll hear about some of the uh, projects driven in Kirkland and in China, for example. And we encourage collaboration. You don't want the collaboration, you, and, you, and when you have collaboration, you want to divide up components. If you have a project X that's got three components, you know you don't have three people in, in, in you don't have people in three sites working on all aspects of the three components, and that's a recipe for disaster. 
Ideally, you want just you know, two sites or so to work on the projects, and you want each one to clearly own certain components, and one of them to be the uh, primary delivery. Right? So that comes out fairly naturally by who the thought leaders or critical mass is. Um, we communicate a lot. Uh, that's why I've spent a lot of time traveling. Um, the second time I'm in Kirkland, I've been to a lot of other offices. Um, Peter Wilson, who's in the back, who manages our um, uh, Kirkland office, will be coming to China to visit us. So lots of travel. But also, we believe video conferencing does work. Uh, and we install it in every conference room. Actually, in almost every conference room, we have a setup like this one with two projectors, one able to project PowerPoint or a demo, the other one showing people at the other side. And, and of course, that's a camera allowing for two-way communication. And we have lots of mailing lists, meetings, and gatherings. And lastly, it's important to give some top-down direction. You know, not micromanagement, but just high-level direction. That everything we do should be about organizing the world's information. So that's how we give people a lot of freedom, but you know, we also don't have a lot of random projects. And we have a very simple rule of 70-20-10 of doing 70% search and ads, 20% related to search, and 10% brand new things. And we try to manage that distribution across the board. Just to give for people who are not familiar with Google, here's, here's how we innovate. Uh, in contrast with many models of um, innovation, I've worked in many companies, and here are some of the research R&D ideas I've run, run into. So if you think about R&D, it's really research and development. Research is the person who comes up with a cool idea, generally measured by how cool and new it is. Development is the process of turning into a useful product, generally measured by user requests and, and, and usage or or if you're selling a product, uh, revenue or volume. Um, but this R&D aren't really one entity. They're really two entities. So how have other com companies managed them? Right? There's been a, a purely ivory tower approach. Just do research, and when you're done, publish a paper and you're done. That's what universities do. And that's what Isaac Newton did. Right? Of course, it took many hundred years before his ideas really mattered. But he was just a researcher, and still many professors do that. And there's a role and a place for that, but that's not our model. Another model is build and they will come. Right? Let the research, the scientists, come up with something. And then whatever they say, go make it into a product. That's how uh, Xerox Park came up with all those great innovations. But as the scientists started driving products, they tend to make mistakes. And that's why. Um, graphical user interface, bitmap displays, ethernet, and so on. All were wonderful ideas, but not productized by Xerox PARC. Another one is reverse DNR. Basically, hey, it's about making money, satisfying customers. Just go ask customers what they want. Um, find out what makes money. And uh, we'll even have them, we'll have them drive all the priorities of innovation. If customers ask for feature X, you shall build X. If you build Y and customers don't think they want it, you shall not build Y. Now, that model, of course, will satisfy the customers, but the downside of that approach is that you'll miss the disruptive innovations. Imagine 15 years ago asking customers, hey, do you want a browser? You know, they'll say, what? No. Right? If you take that model, there would never be a browser. So that's good for some things, but not always great. Um, some companies just have separate R&D, you know, have a research lab and have a product development organization. And I think the good thing about that is you can measure each one by its own metrics, right? research by how innovative and new it is, development by how useful, profitable, and how large a volume you sell and use. And then the two interact by research coming up with innovations and selling it by going to a product group saying, take this. And then product group can, in turn, request, please innovate in this area. And they're separately managed until they generally are at the you know, CEO or president level. But those are some of the advantages. The disadvantage of the approach is that you know, humans are humans. There's going to be emotions mixed in, in all this interaction. Right? Researchers will want to own things. Some researchers will feel, hey, I'm the smart PhD. I, I should get all the credit, and I should own and tell you what to do. And some product people are going to feel, hey, I'm the one that's making money for, for the customer. You're just um, you know, a random researcher. And I certainly have been in both, shoe, both sides of the uh, negotiation. And I can tell you, it's quite frustrating to be in research, coming up with a brilliant innovation, going to a product group, and they say, oh, we don't have time for you. Customers aren't asking for this. Go away. And then three years later, they would say, hey, our competitor just did that. I want it tomorrow. So that would be the downside of the separate R&D. So each of this has strengths and weaknesses. So Google's approach is very simple, is that R equals D. 
So we want people who are innovative and get stuff done. And the reason we want that is we firmly believe people who come up with ideas, love the ideas, who also have strong engineering capabilities, they're just more driven, more motivated to work harder and get stuff done. And there's no human emotion, politics, or technology transfer. It's that same person who would get it done. And we also want people who are innovative so that they don't have to be managed closely. So they're you know, self-starters, come up with ideas, not ready to just be told what to do, um, and, and also be very open to admit failure when ideas don't work. So I think Google's magic really is finding a set of people who are innovative um, and also good engineers, and, and also the other things, care deeply about customers, and then really empowering and trusting them. And management merely becomes a matter of you know, recruiting um, and um, setting up processes and supporting the teams and doing you know, prioritization when necessary. But largely the people are the one who drive the organization. And really the Google's innovation is, is modeled by some of these um, adjectives I put here. You know, R equals D, want people who are innovative and good engineers. Now of course there's a downside. Some really great researchers who are good at writing papers, they may not completely fit in. Right. Some people who are amazing engineers but who don't have good ideas, they may not be perfect fit for this organization. So we may not hire every great person, but we hire people who fit the mold. Uh, freedom, 20% um, time, this famous thing at Google, people have 20% of the time to do what they want. And do what they want within the constraint, it ought to fit in the corporate mission. Um, um, and for the 80% time, the project they're assigned, it's fairly easy to change what they work on. And, and with um, democratic in the sense that if you want to work on your 20% project, or if you want to vote, we people have vote on this idea list that we have in the company, some idea that has a lot of support, people will jump on the bandwagon and help you make it happen. And that's very unique. Uh, Google's very real time. So rather than doing very uh, in-depth, expensive uh, um, market surveys on hypothetical questions, we just put it put both versions available. If you have two possible ways of doing UI, you could render 10 search results or 30 search results. You know, rather than asking people which do you want, uh, you just make both available and see which user exhibit positive behavior. Positive behavior means you know, more searches a day, more click-throughs, and so on. And that example actually is not hypothetical. When we ask people, do you want 10 or 30, people say 30, right? the more the better. But when we measured it, people preferred 10 because there's a small increase in the amount of the time it takes to render 30 so as to negatively impact people's satisfaction. But it's impossible to predict that up front in a marketing survey. So we just implement both versions, let half the user try A, half try B, and then based on how they respond, we'll know which is better. It's faster and, and more um, accurate. Very user-centric. We really believe in building great product, getting users to love it. The rest will come. The rest meaning making money will come later. And sometimes certain properties we have, like uh, news, are not monetized. But that's OK, because news users like Google. They do web searches where we do make money. And then lastly, uh, everything we do is driven by our mission. Right? People speculate, could Google be building product X, product Y, product Z? The answer is really very simple. If, if you think it fits our mi mission, there's reasonable likelihood we might be doing it. If it doesn't fit our mission, then it's a lot more unlikely. And this innovation model, interestingly, matches the internet. So I'm not here to say every company, and you know, I know there's some Boeing engineers here. Um, I'm not saying Boeing should innovate this way. You, know, you can't just build two airplanes and fly them and see which one crashes. Um, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that wouldn't be very good. You'll get good feedback, but you might also have other problems. So it doesn't fit every industry. It fits the internet industry, so because internet industry has similar characteristics. So that's how we innovate. So basically how a product is created is an engineer comes up with a new idea. Sorry this is in Chinese, uh, but I'll explain in English. Um, and then people vote. This is 20% time. I came up with a new idea, people vote. Um, the ones that get lots of votes, you get to build a prototype because people vote with their feet. They'll come and help you. Three of you might pull your time together, build this 20% prototype, and try it out within the company. People like it, great. Then we put it in Google Labs. If you haven't visited Google Labs, please do. And then we measure how people you like it within Google Apps. If they like it, then it goes into beta. And then if that goes well, then it becomes a new product. And the innovator often goes on to the next idea. 
Um, so that's how a lot of our products, um, from uh, Google News to Google Scholar uh, to News Alerts, mobile products, all came out of this 20% project. Uh, in the bubble chart with lots of X's I showed you for China, some of them came out of 20% projects that our new campus hires came up with and basically did on their own initiative. So lastly, I just want to say a few words about um, uh, Google Seattle. Um, these are a bunch of engineers in this very same room. Uh, Google Kirkland office was established in 04, and now there are two, over 200 engineers. Uh, just like I mentioned for China, it's um, very productive, Lots of great people ship lots of products, many others brewing, and it has the same culture, projects, massages, uh, free meals, and ski trips. Um, and, and another interesting thing is that where Kirkland and China are partnering in building a number of projects. Because there are a lot of exciting projects in Kirkland, and they have in interesting um, applicability in China. In many cases, they have to be modified and changed, not just localized. In some cases, there are underlying core technologies that might be applied different ways in China. So uh, Peter, Shiva, and I talked about, hey, shall we have a small group here, or maybe even a large group over time, that uh, takes on, hey, can we take um, all the great things being done in Kirkland, all the great opportunities in China, and hire a small number of people, or medium number of people, to tackle those opportunities, basically the same culture, um, and, and work on both sides. And the excitement is that uh, this team would get to work with fast-growing China, and the employees on this team might stay in Kirkland forever, might go to China in three months, or they might go in a year or two years. And Google is very flexible. Employee transfers are very, very easy, because we know there are a lot of talent in this area, and that people um, don't always want to move to China tomorrow, uh, even though I did. So we're, we are um, growing this, this, this effort. Some of the great projects um, Kirkland has developed that you're probably um, a proud user of includes Google Maps, Google Video, Google Talk, Google Pack, uh, Google Master Central, and many, many others on both client and server side. So clearly here, we're looking for people who you know, like working on server service, um, have Linux expertise, but we're also interested in people who have client side expertise developing win win Windows applications. So it's a fairly broad set of um, skill sets. And generally speaking, people who are innovative and good uh, engineers are just great at Google. There's, we don't really have, you know, you must know language X or operating system Y. Um, good, smart people learn very quickly. And that's what we found in China. That's why the new hires, new campus hires we have are able to become productive after just months. Uh, and of course, we're still growing rapidly in China. Uh, we actually have almost 400 people in Google China. I talked only about the engineering part. And we have about 120 future starts. So counting all that, it's about 500 uh, people that we've hired and about to start. And about 150 to 200 are in engineering. That's what, what I mainly talked about. But of course, we also have you know, marketing, product management, sales, business development, finance, um, many, many other areas. Uh, we are looking for senior people in technology, engineering, product management, business groups. And we have locations um, in a lot of places, too. So if you know people who might be interested, please do let us know. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <coughs>